Hello. We're going to wait about 15, 20 seconds, let people filter in here, and then we'll be starting our webinar. We'll be talking about doing traffic splitting with Nginx. Okay, let's get started. Uh, my name is Jason Schmidt. I'm a solutions architect with Nginx, and I'm joined today by uh, Javier Evans. I'm also a solutions architect with Nginx. And today we're going to talk to you a little bit about how to traffic split with Nginx. So why do we want to do traffic splitting? Uh, we do traffic splitting for things like blue-green deployments. We do things for canary deployments, staged rollout, A-B testing. This is something that we've all probably done at some point in our career, uh, and these are the reasons why we do it. But today, we're going to be talking about how we do that with Nginx Open Source. Uh, and this is all accomplished using the Nginx Split Clients module. And... In order to do this, what we have is we have our front end using the split clients module, and then we have multiple upstreams or back ends, and then there's a key which we use in order to determine where to route our traffic. One of the things you're going to hear Javier talking about in our demo is the key choice. So for the key, we're going to use something like an Nginx variable. So we can use time, we can use the remote IP address, we can use request ID, you have the GOIP module, you can use variables from there, so you're sorting based on city or by region or country. You can also add text strings in there along with your variables to make things more unique. And then what makes a good key? Uh, and this is one of those things where it, it kind of comes down to your use case. Uh, you want to use a key that provides the distribution that you want with the understanding that usually being more unique is going to be better. So the lab we're going to do today, uh, this is part of our, us doing bite-sized bits of Nginx and talking to folks on how to do them. So you need to have Docker, you need to have a modern web browser, you're going to need to clone our repository, and from there we're going to do a Docker Compose up, and we're going to head out to a website hosted locally by one of those containers. If at any time, you know, when you're doing this demo, if you need help, please join the Nginx community Slack. Go ahead and ask the question in the help channel. Uh, and somebody from our team or even somebody from the community will help you. If you have problems specifically with the lab, uh, that's something where you can go ahead and just comment in the repository. Uh, that link there gets you to the organization. Uh, you can comment there. You can go into the repository and comment. Uh, but now I'm going to go ahead and show you what it looks like when we stand things up. And we've put together a brief little movie here showing the clone and stand up process. And uh, while that's running, I'll kind of introduce you to how the demo is set up. So we're trying something new today. We are running this demo using a tool called Livebook. Um, if you've ever used a Jupyter notebook uh, or anything similar to that, um, it'll be familiar to you. Um, this is a version of it that has some extra features that we like called Livebook and it's running on the Elixir language. And so you'll see some Elixir um, in this presentation. And if you go through the lab, it's not gonna be something that you will have to learn in order to understand. It's just kind of how we're structuring, putting together sort of the instructional content as well as letting you run the code and experiment with the Nginx uh, configuration and like keeping it tied on traffic splitting and, and those directives that we're gonna to introduce today. But for the most part, it should just be a Docker Compose up for you and then dealing with a, with a website, which we'll see come up in just a moment. So this, is, uh, this has come completely the rest of the way up and while Javier gets ready with his presentation, uh, just a, a little bit on what the, what the infrastructure looks like. We're spinning up four Nginx containers. We have three back ends and one front end. And then we're setting up the live book and one of the support containers for the live book. And with that, I'll give you Javier to talk through our scenario. 
Thanks, Jason. So uh, yeah, this is going to be a scenario that might be familiar to a lot of you. I've certainly gone through this a few times in my days as a developer. Um, but you know, maybe you've inherited some old service, one of those old services that you know everyone's afraid to touch. Like I remember we had a old Rails application that was really important to a few customers, but no one had given it any love in a few years and it was always kind of tricky to deploy it. So it was really, we were really want to get off of it and get that functionality into something that was more in line with our modern deployment um, strategy so that everything could be consistent. But the cutover is always scary. So what we have here um, illustrated in this diagram is basically you have the new infrastructure over here. You might be running it in Kubernetes. You might be running it in uh, HashiCorp Nomad. And this is what your company um, likes to deploy to. And we've got this old legacy infrastructure that everyone's afraid to touch. Um, and what we're going to do is the front end and the three back ends are all going to be um, represented by Nginx servers uh, for this demo. And we're just going to be changing code in the front end and utilizing the Nginx HTTP split clients module to do some pretty simple traffic splitting to um, kind of gradually ease this back end into uh, rotation here. So I'm going to skip past all this. This is going to be what you go through in the lab. Um, and I'm going to call your attention down here to kind of what the usage looks like and what the different components of it are. So split clients here is, is oops. Split clients here is what we call a directive in Nginx uh, world. And the directive takes two arguments and then provides you with a context here where you can provide some extra information. And looking at it now, it should be pretty self-explanatory, right? We're going to be routing 20% of traffic to our pre-prod. That's what we're calling the backend 03 server that I showed you up above. And then the rest of the traffic is going to go to the backend prod. Those are those other two servers, backends one and two. Uh, the first argument here is going to be your key. This is going to be what's going to determine where a request goes. Requests with similar keys are going to get routed to the same place. Um, and then what happens here is based on, you know, it, it hashes, it makes a hash out of this key and then it's going to decide whether you wind up in that 20% or in the ad additional 80%. And then this name backend pre-prod or backend prod is going to wind up in this Nginx variable, which you'll then use in a very simple, you know, this is the textbook Nginx, uh, reverse proxy setup. And you'll pass that variable into the proxy, uh, directive. Anything to add before we move on, Jason? Uh, the, the only thing I'll add is that you, to keep things simple, we've used two. So we have a, a, a back end we call pre-prod, a back end we call prod. You can actually add additional. So if we want to send 10% of traffic to server A, 10% to server B, and the rest to server C, we can do that breakdown as well. So it, it's Nginx is, is very powerful and has a lot of configuration options, which is which is why it can get confusing at times. So uh, that's why we're kind of want to walk through it with you in a very simple scenario. Right, and you'll see the names here. You'll see backend pre-prod maps to backend prod. I'm sorry, maps to backend one and backend two. And then backend pre-prod is mapping to backend three. So here's the Nginx config. I'm going to jump down and we're going to, uh, we have the same version of our diagram up here. And I'm just going to throw some uh, commands, uh, sorry, some requests at it. Um, you'll note if you look at the configuration, that we're using the request ID. So this is the randomly assigned request ID that every request coming into the, the front end server will get. So our distribution should be pretty even. So I'm going to send a thousand calls um, with a delay between each call of about, uh, actually I'm gonna make it less than a quarter of a second. Um, so now I'm gonna set, start sending these calls and you should see the call counts of what's going where start to tick up. And it's possible that we're getting, that I went too fast. And this is where your hash key uh, choice comes in quickly. I look like, okay, it's actually, it's evening out now. But you can see that we have less traffic overall going to uh, backend three and that the majority of the traffic is hitting the other two backends. Yeah, and this illustrates why it's important to, you know, to, to think about what key you're picking and to go through and do some testing to make sure the distribution is matching what you expect and want it to be. So to give you an example to, of like how important key choice is, I'm gonna stop this 
And we'll go up and, well, actually, let's go through the canary scenario, right? So let's say that our backend, as this is happening, we're monitoring our backend O3 here and just making sure that there's no bugs, you know, it's handling the load correctly. And so, you know, in an A-B test scenario, you're going to, you know, quote unquote, promote this canary, right? This canary came through good. You are going to say, all right, I'm going to send 100% of traffic to it. So let's show that real quick. And for that, I'll go up and I'll just update this percentage here to be 100%. I'm going to send 100% of traffic to back end pre-prod. Pre -prod. And then we're going to clear out, I'm going to clear out, I'm going to, sorry, apply the configuration. I'm going to clear out these numbers here. And then I'm going to, have to rerun, there we go. Uh, and then I'll, I'll send the same request through here. So we'll see that now that we've quote unquote promoted this canary in a very manual way. And you know, this happens, this is basically how you know Kubernetes nomad, this is how these, these you know container orchestration systems work out of the box, um, what they're doing for every deploy. Um, this is a situation where like maybe we don't have access to those tools. And so Nginx gives us the ability to do this um, for free using something that's probably already up in front of whatever you're trying to, to split traffic around. But you'll see that, you know, obviously all traffic is now going to the, the other backend. And you could have added more servers here to the backend pre-prod um, if you, you know, wanted to scale it up as you're going over to Canary. Um, obviously, you can go in smaller increments. Like, you know, Jason, we were talking about blue-green deploys. And, you know, you could say, you could do like a staged rollout. You could say, I want to go from 20% to 50%, you know, and kind of monitor it as it goes up to make sure that you don't have that big switch over that creates that incident for you. Um, but I think, Jason, what I want to show next um, is maybe moving to a, a key that's a little bit more sensitive to timing. Mm -hmm. um, so in this demo, we've got a custom Nginx log format that basically shows you all of the different things that you have available to you in the context of these requests. So I'm going to choose the, the time here. And I'm going to go ahead and set the key to the time stamp on the request. And let's push this back to 20%. So we'll get back into that original scenario. All we've changed is the key. I'm going to save the file. And in the demo, you'll have to go through and apply the configuration. And then, oh, interesting. Why is it? Oh, I know. Got to stop the request here. OK, apply the configuration. Uh, I'm going to clear out those numbers again and restart our graph. Um, OK, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do these calls super fast. I'm going to take out, there's going to be no delay between the requests, which is going to mean that all the requests coming through are going to have similar timestamps. Uh, and we'll see how that distribution comes out. Remember, we expect to see 20% heading over here to back end three. That's what we've configured, but let's run it. Look at that. Didn't do what we expected it to do, did it? And uh, this is because the hashing is going to send things that look similar to a similar place. And all those timestamps that came through, I mean, how long did it take to run those thousand re requests? Like it longer than it took me to scroll up after I clicked, or shorter than it took me to scroll up after I clicked the button. Um, so they're gonna wind up, you know, all kind of going in the same place. If I, if I crank it up a little bit, Maybe we can see some of them. See, look, some of them eventually get over there, and you can see it kind of goes in spurts, right? So at a certain point, they the timestamps became different enough from these two that it it wound up over there. So key choice in understanding the pattern of traffic that you expect coming in when you're doing traffic splitting, like timing might be a good key choice for certain situations, um, but that's going to be up to you, and that's why we want to provide you with a platform to kind of experiment with it and understand how these things will wrap out. Um, any other thoughts, Jason, or directions we want to go next? Uh, no, I mean, I think, you know, for, for me, like the, the discovering the machine running some mission critical application out there, this is, it, it's unfortunately an all too common scenario. Uh, and being able to leverage the Nginx server that in many cases is already there as a way to split the traffic means you don't have to involve the networking group to get another IP out there if it's external facing. You can handle it yourself. You can do the reloads in Nginx. Uh, so it's a very powerful tool. A, you know, it's a powerful tool in your toolbox to handle these like unforeseen issues or these things where it's like, man, everything we have uses no matter Kubernetes. How do I handle this? Well, well, this is the way. It's, it's kind of a manual version of what we started to take for granted 
in something like Nomad or, or Kubernetes. So, uh, you know, that that's one thing. And the other thing is just kind of an invitation to the folks that are watching it either live or later on demand. Uh, if you do have questions, if there are things you want to hear more about, if you want us to go more in depth, please, please uh, put a comment here or go join our community Slack uh, and engage us up there because we're very happy to talk about these things that you can do with the open source version of Nginx. Cool. I think that's probably where we wrap up. Is that right, Jason? Um, one, one more thing to note, I think the one thing that we had on our docket that we didn't address is that the other kind of common key that you might use with this, we're not set up to demo this at the moment, but the other common key that you might wind up wanting to use here is the, oh, I've lost it here. It basically the GOIP module in, in Nginx, um, the uh, module that based on IP kind of lets you understand where someone is coming from in the world. That's one that um, you can put in in that, um, where is it, in the, in the key, in the split clients in the key area um, to kind of get a different type of uh, spread. And the only other thing I wanted to mention, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jason. No, I was going to say, so you can, you can take the remote IP and I think it uses the first three octets and we'll go ahead and use that to hash. Or if you do have GOIP or GOIP2, you can say, I, I want to hash based on, on the region or the state or the city. Uh, again, and, and I, I, do, I do want to uh, just point out, uh, Javier created this whole live book uh, little incubator here. And this is one of the best ways I've seen to work through these scenarios where we try and figure out things like what, what key works best. Uh, it's very easy to use and Nginx can be daunting at times. So I, I really like how this breaks things down. And I really recommend that the people use this if they don't have a lot of Nginx experience because it does have some guardrails for you. Cool. Well, I think that is where we wind up. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming and giving us your attention. As like Jason said before, Nginx Slack is a great place to get in touch with us. You can also engage with us about this particular example on the GitHub repo. Um, if we can put the, uh, or the, the link will probably be in the YouTube uh, description there. Um, we'll have this, this code is all available for you to check out and play with yourself. So thank you very much. Thank you.